My talk now is about farming, and it's about um, wildlife and nature, and also about renewable energy. So the combination of those three things, you know, I mean, uh, for example, in this room, we're in a beautiful part of Ireland here, and just driving up here, you know, I'm always impressed coming into Manalty and the whole beautiful landscape up here in this part of County Meath, and I'm sure across the border in, in County Cavan is similarly. It's an absolutely beautiful place, especially in an autumn day like today. But how many farmers in this room? How many people are farmers? Yeah? Yeah, uh, right, yeah. Probably a third, maybe half people here, yeah? Uh, how many people are really from, we'd say, 30, 40 kilometers of here? Right, nearly everybody. Okay, so you're, you're really kind of a local audience to this area, and you're very lucky in living in such a beautiful place, there's no doubt. Um, uh, and I mean, the, the work of Minalty too, in terms of tidy towns and all the other things. But while we're talking about that, I think there are a few people that Donna and the other organisers have mentioned that really need to be given uh, real credit by the community for the work they've been doing over the years to protecting nature. There's three people that have been doing exceptional work in this area. And Donna and the team here of organisers have decided that they want to show appreciation to those three people for the great work they've been doing for years in this area in protecting natural habitats and wildlife. And they want to present bird feeder and a bat box. First of all, to John Joe O'Callaghan, who I believe is in hospital and who has done incredible work over the years. And John Joe is going to get a bird feeder and a bat box. So could we maybe see what a bird box is like and a bat, <laughs> a bat box is like and a bird feeder is like? Oh, here we go. Great. Brilliant. Wow, that's great. Lovely good. Absolutely. And you, will you give that to... I will give that to John Joe. Well, just tell John Joe that everybody in this room... I, everybody agree? Yes. Absolutely. Really appreciate the work that he's been doing and that hopefully he will continue to do. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. The next is Peter and Margaret Britton, who have for years been doing similar work, and I believe they're in the room here. Yeah? Could we? Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Margaret. And you've got a bat box, is it? Yeah. You've got the bird. Yeah, okay. And you've got, a, you've got the bat box. That's great, Margaret. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. So, looking at farming, you know, and I'll start with farming because, you know, there is a kind of an attitude that farming and environmental organisations and green organisations are not on the same, if you like, working together, you know. There's a tendency of kind of suspicion between both groups and to feel that, you know, one is undermining the opportunities of the other, etc., or the objectives of, of the other. From my perspective, Farming is a critically important part of Ireland in every way. It's, it's a key issue for Ireland, and especially for rural Ireland, and for all of us, and for our economy and everything. And also the farmers are the custodians of the land, and they have, we, have, we, we have to acknowledge the work that they've done over the years in respecting nature and, 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 and respecting our river catchments and all of these issues that are important, you know. But there are big pressures, you know, if we move away from that coming down the track for farmers and for our society and for rural Ireland especially. And, you know, if we just take even Brexit as, a, as an example of the types of pressures that are coming, you know, Brexit is going to be a hard Brexit. There's no soft Brexit coming. It probably means the border will be closed. I mean, if you were to bet on it, Either the British people rebel against a referendum that they unfortunately were misled into, into going along with because so many people in Britain are so disgruntled and, and upset and, and, if you like, disconnected and disenfranchised. They feel very, very vulnerable. And they have been misinformed, clearly. And those opportunist politicians, right-wing politicians, have taken advantage of those people to woo them into voting for something that is not in their best interest, clearly. And Northern Ireland, for example, and Scotland voted against uh, leaving. They want to remain. So there is a major problem, 
But unfortunately, the British government are adamant to go with this. And they're not going to get a soft Brexit from Europe, clearly. It's going to be a very hard. Once they, once they if you like, invoke the, the um, Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty uh, in March of next year, the whole situation is going to change. And it is going to affect farming in Ireland dramatically. At least 40% of all the cattle, uh, all of the, the meat and the, and the um, meat exports and dairy exports from Ireland, which are our two big farming exports, 40% of them go to Britain. That is massively at risk. And I think for farmers looking to the future, they need to really reconsider how they're going to deal with this issue. It's coming down the track. By 1919, it'll be really, really serious for farmers and for rural Ireland, unless the British people come to their senses. And that's not going to be easy to backtrack on a referendum. That's not going to be easy. So it's a very difficult situation that we're in. I'm only using that as an example, and I can't predict anything of what's going to happen with Brexit. None of us can. But the risks are incredibly high. And this could collapse our agricultural industry and have massive implications for rural Ireland. And I think we have to wake up to realising that we need to put measures in place that will address it as quickly as possible. If we wait, we will, we will be left extremely exposed. We need to prepare ourselves and make the changes that are needed. That's one of the pressures. I suppose the next pressure is climate change. Climate change is coming on us extremely fast. It is the greatest ex existential threat that civilization has ever had to face. We're on a trajectory of a plus four degrees rise in global mean surface temperature. The last ice age was four and a half degrees lower than pre-industrial times, you know, going back 11,000 years. If we go back 20,000 years, there's three kilometers of ice over us here, glaciers, and the sea level is 120 meters lower than it is now. So just imagine three kilometers of ice and 120 meters lower of sea level 20,000 years ago at the peak of the, ice age, the last ice age. And that 120 meters is nearly 400 feet, just to clarify it. And the coast of Ireland, well, it wasn't Ireland, it was Europe, because we were interconnected with Europe, because there was no Irish sea at that time, or very little, was, was basically spread out at least 100 kilometres onto, onto the continental shelf in the Atlantic. So we were in an incredibly different situation which was totally inha inhabitable for human civilization. We're now facing a plus four degrees rise the other way. That is incredibly dangerous climate. It is unimaginable what that will bring. We're at now plus one degree and already the developing world is suffering dramatically from the effects of a one degree rise in global mean surface temperature. In massive droughts, in disease spread, in food production issues, in water shortages, in, in sea level rises, storms, hurricanes, massive numbers of impacts. And in 20 years time, these impacts will be so great that there could be hundreds of millions of climate stressed regi refugees spreading across the world simply because they have nowhere to go in, in relocating from where they are, it will be very difficult for them to move into other people's territories because of the pressures on resources. And as climate change gets more serious and population, global population increase and affluence increases in the developing wor developed world and the rich in the developing world become more affluent and follow our ways then we are heading for a runaway climate change. We can't reverse it. All we can do is dramatically slow it down and control it to a level whereby we can continue to exist on this planet. And in Ireland, we're in denial about climate change. The media is in denial about climate change. Our politicians are in denial. Are there any politicians here, by the way? Just TDs, councillors, ministers? They usually are not at these things, I'm afraid, because they don't want to hear these things. And we have a problem with our politicians. 
because they are not going to lead on this issue and there are too many vested interests blocking, if you like, the car in the corridors of power, blocking the solutions that we need for this country. And there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. And the public are confused and don't know how serious it is and tend to kind of bat it off because it's not our problem or it's somebody else's problem. Unfortunately, it's all our problem. And if we citizens don't act on it and don't mandate our politicians to take responsible action and our government take responsible action, we are heading for a disastrous situation. Already we know we're not going to meet our 2020 targets. That's going to cost us probably well over a billion every year in, in fines. That's the likely level. It could be a lot more. But that fine will go on and on until we get out of the hole we're in. And by 2030, we need to have achieved not a 20% reduction, which we're not going to do. We're going to be fall way short of that, the way things are at the moment. And by 2030, we'll have dug a massive hole for ourselves, knowing that we have to reach a 30% reduction. Remember, by 2050, we have to be 90, 80 to 95% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. There's only one way we are going, and that is to solve this problem. And of course, farming is, has an incredible problem with climate change coming down the track. We're going to see massive flooding that we have not seen before. I mean, flooding is going to increase much, much more extreme. And farming is going to suffer dramatically from it. And there's a lot of other problems. But I'm just trying to say that this is your next big challenge that we need to really seriously tackle. And I'm sure everybody, most people in this room understand the issue and understand how serious it is. But for the general public, there's a huge gap and there's huge lack of interest. And when it comes to elections, it doesn't appear on the, on, in the debates or it doesn't appear in the manifestos of any of our main political parties. None of them want to recognise it. But it is going to have massive implications for our children's future. And it's not going to be off there a hundred years away. The impacts are going to come, start accelerating and become quite serious. And there's an awful lot we can do in farming to deal with this. And I'm going to come back to that in terms of the solutions, the things we can do, the opportunities for farmers, the benefits that can accrue from switching in, in farming practice. The next one is biodiversity. You know, we're losing in the world at the moment, we're at a rate of loss of species over a thousand to ten thousand times the background rate of loss of species. In other words, if humans weren't interfering, weren't involved, one species now, one single species, Homo sapiens, is extinguishing species at a rate that has not been on planet Earth for 65 sorry, for 55 million years. That's the science, and it's very firm. We are extinguishing species at a massive rate. We can look to the tropical rainforests, the destruction of those. We can look to uh, our marine habitats, how badly they're being destroyed, and the overfishing and the other issues, the acidification of our oceans now from climate change the warming of our oceans from climate change impacting on species. But we can also look here to Ireland. Uh, if we look at the number of species since 1970, the number of populations of species, leave aside now species or extinction of particular species, the populations of wildlife <coughs> have reduced by over 50% in Irish farms since 1970. Do you want me to say that again? If we look at our bird species, farm birds, which are a great indicator of, of uh, problems, you know, and birds are something we really appreciate. But a huge range of our birds are now at heading for extinction. Common birds that we're so familiar with. I mean, even our curlew in the moors is going to go extinct within the next 15, 20 years. They're down to 15 pairs. Or is it, sorry, it's a very, very small number, incredibly small number. 
And I mean, um, that's among a major range of, of species. <coughs> but we've lost 45% of the population of birds on our farmland since 1970. Now, that's a very serious indictment. Basically, we've used fertilizers, we've used pesticides commonly on our farms. We have, if you like, damaged our hedgerows. We've encroached into, into, into the natural habitats. You know, we've optimized our land. We've um, drained our land and got rid of wetlands. You know, we've done loads of things to improve our farm and to, and to try and make income from our farms. But when you look at the problems, and you look at the problems happening to our water and our river catchments with over-enrichment and all the other things that are coming, and an awful lot of it's coming from farmland. Yes, it's coming from other sources, obviously municipal waste, septic tanks, all the other issues, but it's also coming from farms. And I'm very conscious that this is a very difficult subject for farmers because farmers are finding it very hard to make a living. It's 60% it's of our cattle farmers in Ireland are not able to make a living out of their farms. These are farms of typically 50, 60 acres of land in cattle, whether they're, um, they're suckler cattle or whether they're fattening cattle or small dairy farmers who are now struggling with because the price of milk that was promised them has dropped and they're very exposed. And of course, the big landowners are ready to pounce and take over those farms and up take, see it as an opportunity as farm, farmers struggle. Every time I go to a cattle mart, when I'm filming down the country, I, I, I always try and go to a cattle mart if, if I just see a sign up that there's one on. And I talk to the farmers. And the farmers are very worried. And they feel very vulnerable and very much at, at the receiving end of the big meat barns that are exporting meat and making billions of profit at the expense of the farmers of Ireland. Basically, the big vested interests are controlling farming policy. And of course, the IFA, and there, I, I see changes, by the way, positive changes happening with the IFA, really good changes happening with the IFA, but the IFA have been part of the problem. They've been funded by the big meat exporters for every cow that is slaughtered in their slaughterhouses in Ireland. So they're on the make. And of course, the Farmer's Journal is owned by the IFA. These are the facts. So the information getting to the average small farmer is not correct. It's a very biased in favour of a very small selected people that are exploiting the farmers of this country. And when I look at the problem and I look at our over-dependence on cattle, whether it's for meat or whether it's for dairy. And look at how those farmers are struggling because they're at the mercy of these big exporters who can land in 5,000 cattle into a mart if they see the prices going up. And they do. Farmers have to reorganise. And there's massive opportunities by diversifying. We did a program on it last year in Ecoi, and we looked at the farms, the, the, the choices that farmers have by diversifying. You know, I'd start by the fact that we import four and a half billions worth of food every year to Ireland. Four and a half billion, that's like 1,000 euros for every individual person in this country. That's money that leaves the local economy and goes abroad. 85% of that money goes through our supermarkets because our supermarkets dominate the distribution of food. And farmers are, th are very vulnerable to that whole issue. If you like, 80, you know, those five supermarket chains have centralized purchase. They're competing with each other to make as much profit as they can. And in competing with each other, they centralize purchase. And that means buying the cheapest they can anywhere in the world with massive emissions from all those imports of those products. But farmers find it very hard to get access to market through this route in through the supermarkets. And they're very vulnerable to being squeezed at critical times. Farmers have to plan ahead and they need certainty. And they need to know that they will get 
a certain price for their crops. Having taken all the risks and made all the investments, and you look at the amount of money they get for their crops relative to what we pay in the supermarkets for our food that we buy. So we consumers are a major part of the problem, and farmers are at the receiving end of the problem. And what I'm trying to say is that farmers need to diversify, and the solutions are huge, you know. There's great opportunities in things like agroforestry. In, 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 that's, that's a really good area. There's multiple benefits from it for a farmer in income by doing so. I showed it on my programme. You can then look at uh, the other areas like, for example, renewable energy. Farmers, for example, owning their own wind farms. I mean, in a rural area, the local people should own their own wind farms. That resource of wind that's flying over us shouldn't be owned by developers. That, that basically brings no benefits to the people. It should be decided by the local people. And they should be the ones that should be reaping the benefits. The next would be the whole opportunities with biomass, growing biomass, forests, trees, um, then into things like anaerobic digestion for, for, for biogas. All over Germany, there's 10,000 biogas plants in Germany. Ireland has five. And those biogas plants could create the alternative fuel for people living in rural Ireland for transport. Biogas is a very viable transport fuel, fuel and a very cost-effective one. <coughs> it's zero carbon, incredibly low in any forms of pollution, and it should be the one that should be fostered by farmers through cooperatives. But you need maybe 20 farmers, 30 farmers to come together, set up their own cooperative in anaerobic digestion, and use a lot of their, not just their slurry, but a lot of their grass, the silage. Farmers are very good at making silage, and maybe a third of their silage could go towards this. And if that happened, there's a double win. One is you're now switching from diesel and petrol to, to biogas as a fuel for transport. And by the way, there's other uses for that biogas too, of course, but that's the one I see as the main target because it's very cost effective. And the other one is, of course, that it's reducing the amount of grass going to cattle which means the cattle numbers will come down and the dependency on cattle because the more cattle we produce, the more the milk barns, the, the big meat barns, will exploit farmers. You know, the only way to beat the problem with the meat barns is to kind of reduce the amount of meat being made available to them. But of course cattle grow and you can't just keep back from a mart. You, you have to sell at a certain point. But I think if farmers were smart, <coughs> Not like what's called in the food wise, I think the food wise 2025 is a very unwise plan for Ireland. And I really think there's huge benefits for farmers running, working alongside with environmental groups in every local part of Ireland, in pulling together, in working to make sure that the right policies are put in place in this country that doesn't lead us down the garden path of where we're going with agriculture in this country and that we correct it and make sure that the young generation of farmers growing up in Ireland that are presently leaving and going off to Australian places, that they can find a future in this country where they can flourish into the future. And there are multiple benefits and multiple benefits for the environment, including <coughs> tackling climate change, biodiversity, water, all of these issues, if we were to make that massive switch. So that's my point. I know I've run over time, and I have to say thank you for listening to me. I'm only telling the truth what's honest, what's factual, evidence-based. I've no reason to put any slant on it. And all I can say is that it's people like you that need to spread the word.